welcome Matthew No Arms back. Matthew Learn. No hey, Arms. Hey, Matthew Weathers. Welcome back, Matthew. Hey, happy long weekend to everybody. Matthew, what do you think about the fact that all the top, like these top level physicists and astrophysicists openly admit that the heliocentric model is no more accurate or viable than the geocentric model and they choose it simply based on philosophical grounds? Yeah, that sounds fine. It's the idea that the reference frame doesn't matter. You can He asked you what do you think about that? How do you feel? He said, Yeah, that's fine. I guess it's fine, yeah. Matthew, Matthew, so um, I want to really get to this because I'm interested in the philosophical implications. So you know that their philosophical bias is summarized by the Copernican principle. You know what that is? I don't know what the Copernican principle is, no. Okay, so the Copernican principle uh, simply is that the Earth does not occupy a special position in the quote-unquote universe. So, meaning, um, they perceive it as some type of humility, ironically, through their arrogance, but that the idea that the Earth would be the center um, would make it special or unique, requiring design. So, they, they prefer, philosophically prefer, the Copernican principle, which is that we're insignificant. I, I doubt Copernicus himself would have said that. I wonder where, how you know, that name, because he, he was a theist. Yeah, that is, that, that is well, with the Copernican principle, yeah, it's basically um, it, it, there are assumptions there that can't be validated, so you would have to go with uh, a priori knowledge versus a posteriori. And in that case, well, who's the author? arbiter of that knowledge and what's the justification so again these people are talking about how it's in, they're not in a special location um also if you speak to people who have this worldview today many of them are atheists for some reason so i mean what do you think is going on here matthew yeah those sound like um metaphysical questions ph philosophical questions and and it makes sense that if you're an atheist you're going to like prefer those kinds of things that might like reinforce your atheistic worldview um i i have no commitment to that those kinds of well that's things. why i'm asking you because again I, i'm pointing out that i can cite for you all day long uh infamous physicists and astrophysicists that tell you that you cannot prove that the earth is in a heliocentric model, but that we choose this decision, we make this decision on philosophical grounds. And the philosophical grounds on which they choose that lean towards the nihilistic, atheistic materialism, which is that the Copernican principle is true, meaning that the earth does not occupy any type of special location, it is insignificant. Doesn't that seem to be, isn't that intrinsically kind of contradictory with what you think? Is it is. And I would, I would disagree with them on the, because we, we actually do um, occupy a very special place. Um, even, even among the uh, people who say that there is no God, they would say, oh, isn't it lucky or isn't it fortunate that we're this distance from the sun and, and all that? I think that's a little bit different context because we're, we're talking about position being, central to what we see as the perceivable universe versus no it's it's actually arbitrary uh there isn't a specific that, that's what we mean well no matthew you're also still just wrong so um if you in this heliocentric model and this vastness of this universe quote unquote um it is not that crazy that there's a sustainable planet actually there's expected to be millions of them so what you're saying is just wrong so the fine-tuning principle um, is this idea that all the, every time we look and and look at physical constants, it seems uh -huh. to be designed to be to support life, and that's true right. about almost everything we look at. I'm glad you brought this topic up because I think the flat earthers need to learn a lot about this as well. So you right, fine-tuning. You're right. That is one of the big issues that they have, um, and they really had to face it with the CMB. Fine tuning, like he said, being the idea that well, that would require a fine tuner, and and all of all of this uh, that we observe 
seems to insinuate that there's some type of significance, statistically speaking, to the earth. So do you know, now the same people that brought you this heliocentric paradigm, based on philosophy, are the same ones that uh, are opposed to uh, the fine-tuning problem. So do you know what they're currently proposing to explain away the issue with fine-tuning? Yeah, they say there must be trillions of other universes, the multiverse, which is nonsense because there's no proof it, for any of that. Exactly. The multiverse. That is how devoted these people are to avoiding a designer. And these are the same people that brought you the heliocentric paradigm because of their philosophical preference. So wouldn't you find it pretty intriguing that they'll all tell you you cannot prove that the earth is geocentric. And in fact, it is no more viable or accurate than the geocentric model. And furthermore, it's actually less viable. Yeah, so the, the reference frame doesn't matter as much as is kind of a new thinking. But I would dispute the idea that the heliocentric model was brought by atheists. It was Kepler and Newton and Copernicus, and they were all strong believers. He didn't, I don't, I don't, he didn't say that. Yeah, I didn't say that. Okay, well, the first people who were heliocentrists were, were almost universally theists. Not or wolves in sheep's clothing. Yeah, but yeah, not the point. point. Anyway, so the point is whether or not they were theists is irrelevant. That It was the Copernican principle, which is that the Earth is insignificant when it comes to space. I see. But okay, I'm, I got it. I see what you're saying. Yeah, but I'm trying to point out to you that the astrophysicists that have given you this current paradigm openly admit that the geocentric model is actually more viable, meaning it has less unanswerable problems. Did you know that? I did not know that, and I haven't heard that from anyone. But when I show it to you in about two minutes, I mean, and, and say that is the case, do you, don't you find that pretty interesting, if that were the case? Sure, yeah, that would be interesting. Again, I think it's, it's just uh, which reference frame you use. No, it's not just which reference frame you use, because if the Earth is in a heliocentric paradigm, we have the problem of dark matter and dark energy. Because in 1933, they found out that the galaxy only has about 1% of the mass, galaxies have about 1% of the mass needed to actually move as fast as they do. And they actually move 10 times too fast and that's where you get the fact that they're off by the the universe accelerating. Uh, it needs to accelerate 10 to the 120th power faster. Now, in a geocentric paradigm, you do not have that problem. So the geocentric model is objectively significantly more viable. Isn't that interesting? So I thought that geocentrism versus heliocentrism was just uh, determining whether the Earth is at the center or the Sun is at the center, and it didn't have anything at all to do with dark matter. Well, you're not, yeah, you, you don't get it then. Right. See, I, well, I, I assume that geocentrism well, well, one, has well, problem the, dark here, matter. Here's the thing. One thing makes less assumptions to, I don't even know what assumptions geocentrism would make. Actually, because I'm sure that um, I'm sure that whoever mapped out the sky, <laughs> all they're doing is going off of those angles and they're like, OK, yeah, here's a system. Now, there are other people that are saying, well, these are bodies. This is how far they are. This is where we are in reference to that. And all of this and that and the third. And now there might be dark matter because. You know, there's something wrong with that particular model. Here's an anomaly. Then you do that, and then, oh, my God, here's another anomaly over there. And it's mounting and mounting and mounting when it comes to the heliocentric model. It's just fine if you just keep it geocentric. Yeah, so dark matter is about distant matter and distant galaxies and stars and has little to do with um, the gravity and the position of the sun and the planets and earth i think and correct again 
So the only reason you can say that is because the anomaly or the discrepancy happens on the galactic scale. In your paradigm, uh, our solar system isn't excluded from the galactic scale. It's just a minor portion of. So the problem with dark matter and dark energy still exists where we are in your paradigm because it exists everywhere. Uh, okay, sure. Six percent occupancy is unaccounted for. Ninety-six percent. Now this is where you have the cosmological scale and the um, quantum scale at such odds, because then you have a vacuum on the Earth, and we have vacuum energy, right? And if we were to apply what we can prove by measuring the fluctuations in energy inside of a vacuum chamber to space, that's where we get the discrepancy because we, we know it's there. So when we apply it to space, assuming the relativistic application of the heliocentric model and quote unquote gravity of uh, that is relativity, that's where they get the number 10 to the 120th power because the universe would have to be packed full of something that isn't actually there. And it would have to be moving that much faster. It'd have to be expanding that much faster. The amount that it's off is insane. It isn't just made up. It's based on what we can prove, which is vacuum energy, zero point energy. So that's why you, the quantum and the cosmological scale cannot coexist but only one's actually tangible where we're, we're in real the real world this is a philosophical devotion to a mind mind numbing level and dude the devotion is based on ensuring that our paradigm is that the earth is insignificant so ironically religion was you know cast as science because that's what it is. It's a philosophical devotion. I can quote all kinds of people. I'm about to start dropping the quotes in the chat. And these are the heroes of your paradigm. Maybe. Oh, I don't have heroes like that. <laughs> the heroes I, I, I of the paradigm. Uh, the heroes of your paradigm, not your heroes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is pretty interesting. Yeah, I hear what you're saying, that if there's problems way out there in the galaxies, then that, that model itself would have the same problems here within the solar system or even on the Earth. Um, so yeah. it, it, is a, it is a paradigm that's not working. Um, but wouldn't you see that as sort of a separate question as to the shape and position of the planets and Earth and that kind of stuff? Or, or what does it have to do with the shape of the Earth, I guess? No, no, because the 500 years ago was when this all started, which is kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. But I guess we'll get to that some point. But the surface level portion of it is, well, there were just good theists out there that were, you know, for maybe a lack of knowledge on a language, had to get their information from whomever was ahead of the church at the time. And at some point, they decided Copernicus makes sense. So they started telling people, hey, you know, we're moving around the sun and all of this. Copernicus, go ahead and whip up that model so we can whip up this calendar and do what we got to do. And the people opposed it. And that's what happened um, with the whole Protestant Reformation thing. And so the bottom line is the problem has always been, are we moving or not? Because I thought that we weren't. And I thought that the Bible was true. Now you're telling me all this stuff that the Bible doesn't say when it comes to cosmology. So it definitely is the central point of the problem. Are we moving or not? Who's justified it ever? We know who claimed it. Where did they justify it? Yeah, do you actually so, know the history? Yeah, so 500 years ago, um, it was that, that's when people started... Um, bringing up the heliocentric model instead of the geocentric model. But even before 500 years ago, the geocentric model was a spherical model. So a thousand years ago. That's, it, that's, here, that's hearsay because um, we, see, we see the um, 
the coordinate system that we use for the sky for mapping and all of that, we see that as a plane with uh, what appears to be a sphere on the outside. But we uh, that, that's open to anybody's interpretation. That's not anybody saying that's a sphere. I'm sure there are probably people who did, but those claims aren't really tied to much of anything. Oh, yeah. No, I'm just saying, baseless assertions. I'm so what we're talking about is the difference between movement or not. At this point, doesn't even have anything to do with the sphere because no one's validated that either. No point in even talking about it. Yeah, My we're not point. talking about the sphere. We're talking about motion. Right. We're talking about motion. This is okay, so motion, about. you're right. Motion is sort of about 500 years old. A thousand years ago, there were people who believed that the Earth was a sphere a thousand years ago. No one cares. Okay. Matthew, you weren't alive a thousand years ago. Shut up. But if we're not if we're if we're not if we're not moving and I I I I love where you're going with it I'll be quiet after this, um, and if it, it can't be lost on anyone who cares about this conversation and has a faith and in, in the Creator and 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 values all things that are true, it's very clear right now that we're talking about movement versus non-movement. Because if it's non-movement, then nothing that was derived from that, the, the, the new, the new, the, what do they call that age, age of information, all of this is built off the premise that we live on a sphere that's moving around the sun. At least for the last 500 years, I don't know what anybody else said before that. So if that's the case, then if we're not moving, if that claim, that initial claim was never substantiated, then the whole thing is wrong. The 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 building upon the 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 origin uh, that you don't believe in the Big Bang, um, and what space is, all of that is included. So you can't hold bits and pieces of this belief if we're not moving, not logically and justifiably. You have to take that up with your authority whoever that is, what, what, whatever God that is. I would like to just jump in here. Like Matthew is going to be one of the few Glovers that we can maybe have a decently constructive, honest conversation with uh, that can be informative for the audience. And he is a creationist, right? So I, I don't want it to get too like hostile or anything. I actually think that this may change your life, Matthew. Thank I'm you. Not being hyperbolic. So, do you see? Of course, you've seen this quote. I'm going to be dropping a bunch of quotes. I'm sorry, but when I was in here earlier, it was dead silent for hours. You know, so. Okay, this is yeah, the quote that, I'm sure you've heard. I see the Einstein one. Right. So, I've come to believe that the motion of the Earth cannot be detected by any optical experiment, Albert Einstein. And I'm not saying just everyone that wants to jump in and talk about it. That's cool. It's just kind of try to keep it concise and, and productive. Like you understand that this quote, uh, well, okay. What's to say to this? What, what's your take on this quote? Um, it sounds like he's saying that there isn't a optical experiment that can show motion. Um, and which kind of fits with his idea that, um, you can use any relative frame of reference. So I think it sort of has to do with the frame of reference idea that he is famous for. So then are you, do you agree that Einstein's saying that you can't prove the motion of the earth? Uh, you can't you uh, prove the motion of the earth using any optical experiment. Yeah. Well, that, what exactly okay. do you think that means optical experiment? What does that mean? I think they're trying to use something like the speed of light, you know, or the Sagnac effect and those kinds of things is my impression. Okay, for the audience, um, Sagnac effect was, of course, discovered by Sagnac, who said that it was a product of the vortex of the ether, right? And this is what ring laser gyros utilize. Yeah. The Sagnac uh -huh. effect. Okay. So your understanding is that he's specifically talking about experiments that you utilize light. Right. So then 
Einstein right here is saying that you can't use a ring laser gyro to prove that the earth is moving. I think he was saying that you can't prove that the earth is in motion, um, like instantaneously, like if you're moving at some speed, you would experience the same thing as if you were not moving at all as far as the speed of light. So the speed of light isn't going to help you because because the time so, dilation. So you agree then that Einstein is saying you can't use a ring laser gyro to detect motion of the Earth? No, I don't think he would have said that. Well, that's what that is, an optical experiment? He's talking about motion. Like something, okay. whether something is moving or not. A uh, ring laser gyro, gyro is um, talking about um, rotation. Okay, rotation is a type of motion. So in the heliocentric model, you can't pick and choose rotation or revolution. They're intrinsically tied together. They are not mutually exclusive. If the Earth is rotating, it has to be revolving and vice versa. So I'm not an expert, but I, I guess I would have assumed that he that Einstein was talking about whether you can tell if something is in motion, whereas the ring laser is is determining whether the whether there's acceleration, whether something is changing motion. And I think that those would be two separate things, but I, I get your acceleration point. Acceleration is a type of motion, man. No, acceleration causes motion. F equals M A. M is different than the Hey, uh, if something's stuff. accelerating, is it moving? Uh, there, there might be a point where it's accelerating without moving. What? Okay. So, this the is top, where uh, the top of a parabola. Take physics. This, this one single wow, sentence dude. in the with it, in the with it speaking. You're so me, lost, this is man. Where, this is where I get indignant mildly. Where we start using these tactics where we unjustifiably split hairs, making distinctions without differences. Acceleration, rotation, revolution. This is all motion. Yeah, it's just objective. So, um, Matthew, would you say that he said this quote 70 years, actually almost 80 years after Foucault's pendulum? So would you agree that Einstein's saying that you can't use Foucault's pendulum to detect motion? No, he, Foucault's pendulum is a physical um, thing happening, not a light experiment. Okay, so you, you think that when he says optical experiment, he only means light. I I don't know exactly which experiment he was talking about, but I think he was talking about um, experiments that are like speed of light and those kinds of, yeah. So he wasn't talking about a swinging pendulum, which is a, a mass. Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, so that is, I'm doing this for all the flat earthers so they can learn, okay, how to defeat this argument. So um, that that's right. He gave this speech in context of why he came up with relativity, and he was explaining that what started his journey was Mickelson-Morley. And then he explains that he ultimately came to the conclusion that no optical experiment could ever detect the motion of the Earth. Now, here is another quote from Einstein. To the question whether or not the motion of the Earth in space can be made perceptible in terrestrial experiments, we have already remarked that all attempts of this nature led to a negative result. Before the theory of relativity was put forward, it was difficult to become reconciled to this negative results. Now, here he does not say optical experiment. He says terrestrial experiment, meaning any experiment carried out on the Earth. So you think he was talking about every possible experiment, or, or what is the context? Was he talking about the Michelson-Morley experiment again? Now, this is actually from his writings on special and general theory of relativity. Couldn't get a much better source than that. And in the context, he's not talking exclusively about Michelson-Morley. He says Michelson-Morley and all the other experiments that attempted. He specifically says all the experiments. He specifically doesn't just say Michelson-Morley. Wilson Morley in context of special and general theory of relativity, which you couldn't get a better source from Einstein than what he's famous for, right? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, so he's saying yeah. that there, whether or not there, you, you can't detect the actual motion versus being stopped. And it, that fits with what he was saying, like you were saying to relativity, that being stopped is functionally the same as moving. Um, and it's hard to tell the difference. 
So, <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me, dude? No, it's a relativity. That's just the basic idea of relativity. No, uh, my laugh is oh, rhetorical. Mox, Go ahead, Wes. That's Mox, pr- Mox principle. Okay, so anyway, uh, you act like Einstein came up with the idea. No, no, no. It's called Mox principle. Long before Einstein, Einstein didn't actually come up with anything. But anyway, we'll cover. He didn't that. come up with he 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 was not a genius that came up with new equations. I doubt he was a genius, but uh, all he was a he was a paid shill by NASA, even though they didn't no, exist. See, don't spiral on me, Matthew. I just, no, I was just I'm, I was just straw manning for humor, humoristic effect. Uh, okay, all. okay. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I think he actually was a figurehead put up because they had to respond to Mickelson Morley, which debunked the claim that the Earth was in motion. So they had to come up with a theory that says, well, it had to make it unfalsifiable and say, you could never tell. And Einstein was the guy pushed forward. He was a Zionist. And of course, he provably patched together tons of other people's work. That's just a fact. Henry Poincaré did most of what is in relativity. He took the Lorentz transformation from Lorentz. Most of his work was not his own. Okay, so that's the point. Anyway, so we're, I don't want to take this, make this all, really take too long. So very simply, um, the Globers have always said, oh, it's just optical, you stupid fly. It's just talking about light, which means they don't understand they're debunking their claim of ring laser gyros. But uh, in addition, now what flat earthers normally say back is, no, optical means you can see it. So I actually have to correct the flat earthers here. He is talking in context of, experiments with light optical deduction via light because he's specifically talking about Mikkelsen Morley now it doesn't mean that he is talking he's not just saying just Mikkelsen Morley he's saying any optical experiment so anything with light cannot prove the motion of the earth the flat earthers should critique their approach now I've found another quote from Einstein that does that goes in further detail and says terrestrial experiment this is the main one that flat earthers should actually use because it it says anything on the earth Okay, so whenever you invoke the ring laser gyro invented in 1976, um, you say, oh, well, that happened long after Einstein. He didn't know about it, so he wouldn't have said this quote then. That's one of the best that the Glovers come up with. We'll address that in a second. We'll put that on the back burner. So you bring up Foucault's pendulum, 1851. This is 80 years after that. That means you think Einstein was wrong if you think Foucault's pendulum proves that the Earth is moving. Okay, and... Uh, the mechanical gyro was invented in 1909, so that was again 20 years before this quote. So he did not think either the mechanical gyro or the Foucault's pendulum would prove that the Earth is moving, and he understood this because of Mach's principle, and it could very easily be movement around the Earth. And if you're inside of a system that has motion on the outside, you would actually have motion trickle down to the interior aspect of let's say a hollow celestial sphere for intents and purposes, and you can replicate it. Um, he wrote about all this, which is why it's so funny. It's just that the, the globe earth proponents do not know any of the history, but to be fair, a lot of the flat earthers don't as well. And that's why I'm going to stake my flag on this. It, it ruins the whole paradigm. Okay, so now that we've got that covered, that's just all objective. Okay, so do you have, do you have any, any rebuttal that you would like to say or you want to move on? I uh, no, I see what you're saying. Um that yeah, it's it's hard to prove any type of motion using uh any optical experiment, using any optical devices, or even using um swinging pendulums. I think none of those uh prove uh that there that there's motion happening. 